Well, thinking about um, the risks of nuclear power, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that it is uneconomical. It, there was never a business case, never a, co a commercial legitimacy for nuclear power generation. Since the 1950s it was clear that it would be expensive. There was a hope that it, costs would come down over time, but experience has shown that the more we learn about that technology, the more we actually build nuclear power plants and all the equipment around it, the more expensive it becomes. So the, the core risk of this uh, technology resides or results from the fact that it is too expensive, too risky, and therefore it presents existence risks for the utilities. If a nuclear power plant has a serious accident, and there have been accidents on average every five years in the civilian sector, the risk is that that utility goes bankrupt overnight. Well, um, there have just been the publication of the report um, of the fact-finding mission by the Japanese parliament looking into the Fukushima accident, and I think it paints a very clear picture of what was going wrong. There was groupthink, there was regulatory capture, um, there was um, uh, um, an indulgence in risk-taking whilst hiding the economic consequences. There was a clique of technocrats deeply embedded not only in the, in the industry but also amongst the regulators and in the political decision makers that really didn't care much about public opinion, about the public interest um, as a whole. They just drove path dependently um, a certain policy in a certain direction, ignoring warning, ignoring risks and essentially becoming unable to reform their, their own system. What it tells us, it's human nature the nature of political institutions, the nature of economic institutions, their interests, uh, their dynamics, that make it very difficult, if not impossible, to control the risks of nuclear power. We have had serious accidents not only in Japan, which has a very high um, level of technology control, very high discipline. Um, uh, the uh, nuclear power plants in Japan have all been built uh, not only with the assumption that there can be earthquakes, but with the experience of earthquakes in that country. Um, so, if something like that happens, like Fukushima happens in Japan, it can happen anywhere. We have had serious um, nuclear accident, one in Switzerland, a country that is known for good quality engineering and a high safety culture. We've had a near accident um, in Sweden. We now learn that um, French ski lift operations are safer than Swedish uh, nuclear power plant operations. Um, what we learn from all of those instances is that it is our inst political institutions, our economic institutions, our human reflexes that create the danger around uh, nuclear power, and they won't go away. Germany has basically decided in the 1970s during the oil crisis that they wanted to have alternatives to oil and they invested in the development of renewable energies and in the development of nuclear power. After Chernobyl in 1986, Germany has um, shifted all the research money away from nuclear power towards renewables, and basically the German political elite across the political spectrum and the business elite and the popular um, opinion, they all wanted anything but nuclear, but they didn't know what. Since 1990, Germany has legislation in place um, to promote the expansion of renewable energy. It started with water and with wind and with solar, but now it has expanded also into geothermal uh, and in, into biomass. Since 1990, we are on a policy vector that says expansion of renewables towards the phasing out of nuclear power. Since 2000, we had an agreement between the um, uh, electricity industry in Germany and the German government about a nuclear phase-out, which was based on residual running time of the existing um, nuclear power plants. The assumption was always that the residual running time would be used up somewhere in the year um, 2021 to 2023, in that range. It was impossible to predict precisely because it depended on the capacity load factor um, of the uh, nuclear power plants. After Fukushima, we basically had a confirmation of this long-standing policy um, saying, yes, we will phase out nuclear power, we've put a date to the end date now, and we no longer limit the amount of power that can be produced in the existing nuclear power plants, but we simply give them shut-off dates. So it's a slight variant. In actual fact, it is a slight extension um, of the phase-out compared to what was the um, agreement in 2000, and more nuclear power will be generated over the remainder um, of the running time 
than was previously the case. In Germany we have a term for the societal conflict over nuclear power. We call it a grand societal conflict, gesellschaftlicher Großkonflikt. Um, since the 1970s we have had uh, high levels of controversy, um, high levels of radicalization of various groups, uh, increasingly uh, or on occasion violence uh, in the streets, since the decision, the agreement between the government and the power industry in Germany uh, in 2000, that whole conflict has practically disappeared. It played no great role anymore. Yes, there were occasional demonstrations, particularly associated with the transport of nuclear uh, waste uh, through Germany and the question of nuclear waste storage, but on the whole, the whole area was pacified. After, before and after the decision um, in 2010 to extend the running time of the nuclear power plants, which implied that the government and the industry behind it were trying to get new life for the industry, to perhaps build new nuclear power plants in the future. This grand societal conflict that had been pacified for more than 10 years broke up again. Um, and you saw grandparents taking their grandchildren to demonstrations against nuclear power. You saw the um, politicization of another generation. You saw radicalization. You saw the Greens, who are the um, political party with the highest anti-nuclear credibility, moving towards almost 30% in the opinion polls. Not votes at elections, but, but opinions expressed in opinion polls. And you saw a complete erosion um, of the uh, center-right um, uh, pro-business uh, parties that run the country at the moment. So there were very strong, not simply electoral, short-term electoral reasons, but long-term political considerations um, to reverse that mistaken decision uh, to extend the running time of nuclear power. Um, so the accident, the tragedy in Fukushima provided the German uh, administration with a face-saving occasion to actually reverse a politically disastrous decision that they had taken a few months earlier with the, ex with the extension of the running time of nuclear power plants. The situation in the UK um, is that in the United Kingdom the nuclear power um, sector is deeply wedded to the nuclear weapons program of the United Kingdom. In contrast to Germany, which is a purely civilian nuclear technology country, nuclear power um, country, the UK, United Kingdom, also has nuclear weapons programs. So it has a different technology base for the industry, um, uh, it has different fuel cycle needs, um, and it has in the political elite a much stronger relationship between the nuclear industry and the security establishment, which makes it, like in France, impossible to criticize nuclear power without being accused of being unpatriotic, because you're, by reducing the legitimacy of nuclear power, you're reducing the legitimacy of nuclear weapons, and that is um, damaging the safety of the nation. When we look at the transition, uh, we need to first recognize that we have very high external cost, as the economists call it, associated with the use of fossil fuels. All the cost of adapting to global warming are really costs that should be associated with the use of fossil fuels. And we have very high external cost um, uh, in the nuclear sector as well. And that's not just the accidents that have happened that we've uh, talked about already, but the taxpayer also provides for the training of the sector, it pays for the research, it pays for the fuel cycle management, the legacy cost, the decommissioning and the legacy, the long-term waste storage, these are all costs that will be absorbed by future taxpayers. It's a liability that we put onto future um, uh, generations. All of this is not reflected currently in the price of nuclear power. If you were to reflect it, in the price of nuclear power, then it would be already uneconomical. You would never build new nuclear power plants. If in addition you forced the operators um, of nuclear power plants to buy insurance for third-party liability for the damage that an accident can cause to others, if they had to buy insurance on commercial markets today, they would not run any of their nuclear power plants because it would be prohibitively expensive. Saving energy and producing electricity by alternative means will always be cheaper 
than running nuclear power plants with the risks that they currently represent but that are not reflected in the price. I think we first need to acknowledge that the current pattern of dealing with nuclear waste is not satisfactory. We are leaving much of the nuclear waste on the site where it was generated, on the sites that were uh, built for the nuclear power plants. Um, that is creating targets for terrorists, uh, targets for enemy action in the case of international armed conflict. Um, they are not protected for the long run in those locations. Um, and we have seen also in the accident of Fukushima that the physical proximity of reactors and waste and spent fuel rods can cause a problem in case there is an accident because it limits the room for manoeuvre and the ability to uh, intervene in order to correct the system and avoid uh, more serious consequences. So the first one is to acknowledge that something needs to be done and we need to spread out the waste and put it into um, uh, uh, dedicated locations. The second one is we need to um, uh, understand that we need to put the waste away in such a way that it is very difficult for future generations uh, to get back to it. Because we don't know about the stability of our political systems, of our societal systems, of our civilization. We don't know if there will be f in future criminal elements that want to get um, to that material either to build bombs or to extract poisons or build uh, dirty devices or whatever they want to do with it, the fantasy. Um, um, isn't large enough to imagine everything that people do. We need to put that stuff away somehow. Um, what we need to recognize is that we should put away the nuclear waste as it is in the simplest way that we can do. Um, the more we reprocess the waste, in particular the spent fuel rods, the more secondary waste we create, the more volume we need to dispose of in the long run. Um, in my opinion, we should go for direct end storage of whatever is possible um, and uh, not go through the process of reprocessing, which ultimately only increases the amount of waste. The difficulty of finding suitable storage has something to do with the fact that it is difficult to find repositories that are safe for tens of thousands of years. Um, to persuade the people in the local community that that is something that they should accept. But it's also difficult to get the acceptance um, in societies that are critical towards nuclear power because the fact that there is no final depository at the moment creates a regulatory hurdle for the licensing of new nuclear power plants or the extension of running time of very old, sometimes very old, uh, nuclear power plants. In case there were a solution to the waste problem, the concern is, the suspicion is that then lobbyists for the nuclear industry would find it even easier than they do today to strong arm regulators and politicians into giving them more licenses to operate nuclear power plants, perhaps build new ones and to generate more waste. The minute we have um, a societal agreement, legislation in place and perhaps a constitutional amendment in Germany that says nuclear power is phased out and will not be um, uh, invested in again. I think that part of this concern will disappear and then it will become easier to persuade the public in various places that as the nuclear waste has to go somewhere, it has to be safe, it has to be for the long run, um, that then people will agree that this or the other side should be developed and explored. One of the issues we have is that countries generally only look at one option, perhaps two options for storing the nuclear waste. In essence, that feels to the affected communities like blackmail. It feels like they are being victimized because nobody else wants the waste. There is no fairness. Um, the regional distribution, putting the waste into different locations and therefore making sure that's not just the northerners but also the southerners that are sharing the burden, um, that would also make sense. It's the, the perceived unfairness by having only one group that will have to suffer the consequences of having the nuclear waste in their vicinity that's causing a problem. It is sometimes said that uh, nuclear power actually helps the uh, energy security of a country. Uh, the World Energy Council, for example, bases its ratings of energy security of a country um, uh, based in part on um, the use of nuclear power. The um, idea behind that is that for a country, 
um, it is relatively easy to buy a stock of nuclear fuel so that it can actually have fuel for 40 or 50 or 60 years of nuclear power stored on its territory. It is therefore uh, resilient um, or immune to the effects of a trade embargo. Um, that is a measure that is used in order to explain why nuclear power um, helps with building uh, energy security. On the other hand, you have to see that um, nuclear power plants are inherently intermittent. They can go off without a warning, within a second they are um, off the grid. Um, and they do that quite often. Um, if you look at the statistics, I think, um, uh, in a, not an extreme case, but a, a good il illustration of how bad it can become, is the United Kingdom, which has a very old fleet of reactors, all of which are supposed to retire within the next decade simply because they're overaged. Um, in the years 2008 to 2010, so over three years, the average capability loss factor, unplanned capability loss factor in the United Kingdom was just under 25%. So one day out of four, the nuclear power plants were down for some unplanned reason, some accident, some incident that happened. Um, the nuclear power plants, even though they're not yet 40 years old, they're only 30 years old, they're already so creaky that they're turning themselves off. And that is in spite of the fact that the um, British nuclear power plants are actually an inherently safe design. Um, safer than the others because they are at much lower levels of criticality, they are slow burners, so they are under much less physical um, um, uh, stress, engineering stress than, than other plants, and yet they experience those problems. Um, uh, you also have other components in energy security um, in addition to the intermittency, and that is the um, disruption, potential disruption of your nuclear power plant systems through terrorist attack, through enemy action, through extreme weather events, not affecting the plant itself, but the transmitter stations, the interconnectors. There are many parts of the system um, that you have around nuclear power plants that make the energy system as a whole more vulnerable than the uh, decentralized um, self-stabilizing systems that you can have if you have distributed generation. Very often people say that nuclear power is a bridge towards a future of renewable energy. Um, I don't believe that it is. Um, I don't think we need that bridge in that sense. And I do believe that there's a fundamental incompatibility between the centralized um, energy supply structure that you need for nuclear power and the decentralized smart infrastructure that you need for renewable energy. I think that fossil energies are a bridge to a um, renewable future, in particular natural gas. Um, renewable energies, um, they are variable. Um, the solar energy varies with the course of the sun over the day. It varies with the season and it varies with the weather patterns. So it's a modulated but highly predictable uh, system. Wind energy is highly predictable. The four-day wind power forecast is more accurate than the four-day power demand forecast. Because for wind power forecasts, it's not necessary to know whether um, there will be precipitation or not. It's only necessary to predict the wind speeds and that is relatively easy. The margins of error over four days are relatively small. So it may be variable but it's highly predictable. And in a way they are mutually supportive. Um, we have more solar power during the summer, we have more wind power in the spring and in the fall, uh, we have more um, waste electricity from heat generating from combined heat and power plants in the winter when we have the heat needs. We have the highest demand for electricity in hot climates where air conditioning determines the power demand exactly at the time of the day and at the time of the year when the incidence of solar power is the highest. So putting solar panels on the roof of a house that has um, uh, air conditioning in it is actually a very easy way of balancing on the spot and reducing the stress on the system as a whole. Bringing together the components in an intelligent way, making this, the, the um, grid smart and creating incentives for power users to shift demand in time, those are the keys. They're not difficult to imagine, but what they require is a different attitude by the people who design energy systems and who manage energy systems.
It is sometimes said that uh, Germany can phase out nuclear power because our neighboring countries like France and the Czech Republic, possibly also Poland, um, are running nuclear power plants, would be able to export excess nuclear power into Germany in order to help stabilize the German uh, grid. Um, and are planning to build uh, more nuclear power plants in the future. This is a myth. Um, France has not built new nuclear power plants for some decades and with the one plant that they're building in Flamanville they have great difficulties. Delays, cost overruns, quality problems with the concrete, with the welding, wherever you look, the French can't build nuclear power plants. Similar problems also on the construction site in uh, Finland. Um, now with the new administration in France, um, they've decided to, f to not phase out but um, decrease the importance of nuclear power in France and reduce its share from 75 to 50%. The Czech Republic had plans to build 14 nuclear power plants. They've abandoned 12 of them and they're still sticking to two of them. Um, they don't make economic sense. If the Czech Republic wants to build them, they will need to give very large subsidies, cheap loans, loan guarantees, direct subsidies, um, guaranteed prices for power that is produced afterwards. All of these subsidies will be tested by the European Commission against the European legislation against state aid. This is something that we're already seeing in the United Kingdom. The British government is at the moment trying to establish a framework that would allow private investors, in this case the only one that is credibly on the market is French government-owned uh, Electricité de France, to come into Britain and build nuclear power plants. And it's becoming clearer and clearer as long, uh, the longer the uh, discussion goes on that it is impossible to build nuclear power plants without massive investment, uh, with massive subsidies, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to provide those subsidies and be compatible with European legislation on state aid. Um, in consequence of having the disciplines, the fiscal disciplines and the disciplines against uh, state aid distorting competition between countries, between companies, but also between technologies, it will become impossible to build nuclear power plants in Europe. I am Andreas Krämer, I am the director and CEO of Ecologic Institute here in Berlin and I'm also the chairman of Ecologic Institute in Washington DC.